learning. Got one. Okay. I just thought I needed to give a word of explanation this morning uh, because I'm starting a new book and I am probably going to be finished preaching here next week. And I have no intention of doing the whole book in two weeks. <laughs> So why am I doing it? Uh, I, I asked myself that question on Monday morning. Should I do something different? Uh, not knowing whether the church will vote for Bob or whether Bob will answer that call or what, or, or should I just go ahead with what I, I had prepared? And I don't know if I took the easy way out, <laughs> but I decided to go with what I already had prepared. And, and I, I do that for a reason. For the last several months, we've had at least two candidates come, and I, I probably most of this year, I have chosen to go through some of the smaller New Testament books because I didn't know whether I would get to finish them or not, and I could always squeeze in the, the, the smaller books. And, and then with, when our last candidate came and it didn't work out for him to come, we didn't have anybody in view didn't have a candidate. We, we had contacted uh, Pastor Bob, but he had, uh, uh, had decided to go a different direction. And so we had filed his resume away. And I thought, if nobody's in view, I'm going to try a longer book. And, and I had prayed about it, and, and, and I realized I haven't taught First Corinthians for about 15 years. And so th this was a good time to get back in into First Corinthians. And then after I started working on it, suddenly we had a candidate and things have gone rather rapidly. So why go into the introduction to 1 Corinthians? I am doing so for a couple of reasons. Number one is that I believe this is what God wants me to bring to you, but also because some of you listened to what I had to say. <laughs> that doesn't always happen. I, I've had several people come to me and express the fact, if you recall, about a month ago, I gave you a warning. We were going to go into 1 Corinthians, and I encouraged you to read the book. And I have found out since then that several of you have read the book. And, and so uh, I thought, okay, I have to go into the opening part of 1 Corinthians because sometimes... If we're not careful, we get the wrong idea about what Paul is doing in 1 Corinthians. So I want to stress that this week and next week of what's going on here. So with that in mind, let's look at 1 Corinthians 1, 1 through 3 this morning. Paul called as an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Sothenes, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus Saints by calling, with all who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. As I think of what was going on in Corinth, I couldn't help but reflect on the fact that ours is not the perfect church. We have some problems. The reason I can say that is because I know who your pastor is. <laughs> and if you don't have a perfect pastor, you can't have a perfect church. Uh, I'm not suggesting that we have the problems here that Corinth was facing. Uh, I, I feel confident in leaving, knowing that God is bringing somebody here, but I also feel confident in leaving that we've addressed some of the problems that we've had over the the last few years, and, and I personally, as I shared with Pastor Bob, I believe this church is ready to grow, to move forward, to, to, to reach out to, to the community. But in saying that, I'm still going to say we're not perfect yet. We haven't fully arrived. We're not home with Christ in, in glory. All of us, like the people in Corinth, wrestle at times with some tough issues. In Corinth, there was some moral issues they had to face. There were some spiritual issues, financial issues, doctrinal issues that, were, that had come up. And they needed, I think as we do, a course 
in applied Christianity. How do we handle those conflicts? How do we handle those battles that we face sometimes as a church, sometimes we face it as individuals, uh, as, as God works in our hearts and life there? And so I think Paul wrote Corinthians to give them a course in, in applied Christianity. He was not writing to criticize the church. He was not writing to reveal that, hey, this is a church with problems. He was using them as an example, I believe, to teach us some tremendous spiritual principles. And I trust that as you read through the book and you think your way through the book, you don't focus on the problems that he was addressing there. But look at some of the tremendous doctrinal truths that he reveals to us in this book. The opening chapters takes us to the cross of Jesus Christ. Where would we be without the cross? And what impact should that have on our lives today? And later on in the book, you get to chapter 13, which is known as what? The love, the love chapter. One of the most beautiful descriptions of love, I think, that the world has ever seen. Uh, written to a church that had some problems. And then you come down to chapter 15, and he deals with some tremendous truths about the resurrection. What what do we have to look forward to when we leave this earth? Uh, uh, Paul went overboard, I think, in this book to, to share some tremendous doctrinal truths with, with this church. But as we begin looking at the introduction, notice what Paul says in verse 4 there. He says, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you in Christ Jesus. Now, we're going to focus on that next week. The grace of God that he, he gave to us and so forth. But uh, for this week, I want you to realize here was a church that had received the grace of God. Here was a church that was loved by God. Here was a church that was being used by God in this society in which they found themselves. And I think there's a message of encouragement in that for us today. Because we all face struggles as we walk through life. We, we, we all face some difficult situations. We, we all have questions at times that we, we wrestle with here. And, and if God can look at Corinth and say, they are recipients of grace, then we can look at ourselves and say, praise the Lord, we've received the grace of God as well. And, and I want you to go one step farther with that today. Don't just say, praise the Lord, I've received the grace of God. But I want you to look at your brother and sister and say, praise the Lord. They're recipients of grace as well. Together, we have received the grace of God. So before we look at the introduction that I read this morning, I think we need some background information to help us understand the, the, the book of 1 Corinthians there. Why did Paul write it? As I said, he was not being critical he was expressing his love for the church. He was the founding father of the church. If you go back into the book of Acts, and I'm not going to take the time to go back there this morning, but uh, he had remained there for at least a year and a half, if not longer than that, which was a long time for the Apostle Paul. Some places he was only there a few months and, and then moved on. And, and, and I think it, it's good for us to wrestle with that for a little bit today. Why, why do we change pastors? Why, why do pastors move? You ever wrestle with that? Why don't they just stay? Because we get comfortable with them. And, uh, uh, but you know, God, and I think especially in smaller churches, there comes a time when different gifts are needed. If you recall, as we started the, the process with uh, Pastor Bob, I said, don't look for another pastor dad. You don't need another pastor dad. You, you already have one. And, and if, if that's what God felt that we needed, then I would be here. But I think he has something different that he wants to do. I, I, I remember talking with our, well, former pastor now of our Evangelical Free Church in, in Bozeman, uh, Chris Blackmore. He founded the church. He spent something like 40 years there. He. He said on one occasion, he said, you know, 
He said, I really pray for the pastors in smaller churches because they have a much more difficult job than I have. Now, he's pastor of a church, or was, of several hundred people. I look at that and say, how in the world can he do that? that I, I, I wouldn't want to do that. that. That's way too many for, for me to handle. Uh, so I said, what, what do you mean by that? He said, well, you know, I have a whole staff that have different gifts than I do. And where I am lacking, they are strong. But he said, you're out there with your gift or gifts. And if you need a different gift, sometimes you don't see it or don't find it in the church. So yours, he said, is really a more difficult ministry than than mine. And so uh, we we don't always like change, do we? But sometimes God says change is necessary for the sake of of the body there. So he, he was writing to the church as the founder of the church, writing in response to a letter, actually. If you go back to chapter 7, verse 1, he had received a letter from the church. Uh, he, he said, now concerning the things about which you wrote, and he goes on to explain some of those things. But the problem with that is we don't have that letter. We just have one side of the conversation, in a sense. Uh, uh, it would be great to have that letter, but... Uh, The encouraging thing is that here was a church that was seeking God's guidance for their church. And so they were concerned. They wrote to the Apostle Paul and asked, what would God have them to do? It's always difficult to have just one part of the letter. I remember years ago, I was probably, I can't quite remember whether I was a sophomore or junior in high school. I was just at the age where I was beginning to think maybe there was a purpose for girls. <laughs> I had grown up with four brothers, or three brothers, and I was the fourth there. Uh, hadn't interacted. We lived out in an isolated area. Hadn't interacted that much with too many uh, girls. And so um, I was beginning to think maybe... There, there was a girl that I was kind of getting interested in. Uh, and I didn't know how to go about starting a relationship with her or anything. And one day, I, I don't know if she thought I was getting interested or what, but one day she handed me a letter as I was leaving church. Now, she didn't go to my school. She, went to a, she was in a different school district, but we were in the same youth group. And she handed me a letter. And, and in it, she went into quite a bit of detail about her life. She had been in an orphanage. Uh, She and her sister had been adopted by a family in in our church and and on and on of what she had faced, just trying to share so that I would know her better. And I thought, okay, this is a good start. And so I wrote her a letter and slipped it to her. And then about a week later, I found out she had shared that letter with several in the youth group. And it even got back to my brother. And uh, he, he was ridiculing me for some of the things that I wrote and, and so forth. And I thought, if that's the way it's going to be, I'm not having anything more to do with her. And I didn't. That, that, that was the end of that a beginning of a relationship there. So, and I never told anybody that I had gotten the letter first, or, or what, why I had given that letter to her there. I, I th- thought, you know what? That's none of their business. And I'll just let it go at that. Uh, so Paul received the letter, but he doesn't give us the, the information of all that was in it there. But it was a typical church in many ways. It was a church, I believe, that had a desire to know God had a desire to know God's will, and they were even willing to change if God revealed a change was necessary. Now, that's commendable in a church. Uh, I I, I trust if Pastor Bob comes that nobody comes up to Pastor Bob and say, we've always done it this way, Or, or, or we've never done it this way before. Let God lead as God wants to lead in in your life and and in your church. I I say it was a typical church because 
they had trials, they had problems, and so do we as individuals, so do we as a congregation sometimes. It, it, it's a fact that God is at work. Uh, it, it, I think the important thing is there, what does God want to say to us? What, how does he want to lead us individually at, and as a church? And the question I think we need to ask ourselves is, how can we effectively serve Jesus Christ? Because you know, when you think of a church, it's not about us, it's about him. We, we sang that song, The Heart of Worship. He is the one that we should focus on. We're here not for what we can get out of a service, we're here, how can we best serve him? How can we honor him? How can we draw closer to him there? So that leads us to the, the setting of the church here. It was the city of Corinth. In Paul's day, it was a city of approximately a quarter of a million people. Now, I, I always thank the Lord that he's led us to Soap Lake, different churches out in the country. If I was asked of the Lord to go to a city of a quarter of a million people, the first question I would have to ask is, Lord, what did I do wrong? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not a city person. I, I'm, that, that just is not me. But it was the Apostle Paul, evidently. Originally, it was a it, Greek city because it is in the land of Greece. But the city had been destroyed by Rome because they had rebelled against one of the Caesars. They came and destroyed the city. But then in 46 BC, Julius Caesar, recognizing that it was a strategic location, he made it, he rebuilt the city and made it a Roman colony. He uh, moved in veterans that had served in the military for years, gave them land to which they could build a house on and live on and so forth. So it became a mixture of Greek and Roman and men from all over the empire and their families. It, it was, in a sense, a, a melting pot there. And so it became, first of all, a commercial center. It was on the edge of a four mile wide or four mile long isthmus that, between the Ionian Sea and the Aegean Sea. And uh, the ships would come in on one side, unload their Cargo, it would be transported to four miles by land and put on another ship. And it saved them a, a lot of time and effort of trying to sail around the, the bottom of, of Greece because some of that sailing was dangerous there. Uh, if the ship was small enough, they had a system of poles that they could roll the ship up onto and roll the ship for four miles and put it in the ocean on the other, or in the sea on the other side there. So it, it, it had become quite a commercial center there, a very wealthy area. It was also a religious center. The main temple in the city was the temple to Epaphrodites. It was dedicated to the sex trade. They had over a thousand prostitutes in, involved in the city and the worship there and so forth. They also had the Asherah coming from the Old Testament days. They had uh, Mel Mela Sirtis, who was the patron deity of navigation, was worshipped, much like the Baal worship. And they had a temple to Apollos as well. Now, Apollos was the god of music, of song, of arts, and poetry. And his worship included all kinds of, of perverse practices there. And then added to that, since it was a Roman colony, they also worshipped Caesar. And every citizen, once a year, had to come and bring just a little bit of an offering to Caesar and offer incense to, to, to Caesar there. So the reason I mention all of that is this was a very difficult place to live the Christian life. The pressure was on. If, if you didn't worship Caesar, if you didn't uh, go to some of these temples, it was hard to do business. It was hard to maintain a, a Christian lifestyle. They clashed, the Christians clashed with the culture of Corinth. And you know, as I think about that, I wonder, do we clash with the culture today? I think we should. 
I, I, I think the, the world should be able to see a difference in, in our life and our lifestyle. It was also a, a corrupt center. The word Corinthos originally meant an ornament. It was a, a very beautiful city when Julius Caesar rebuilt it. But by Paul's day, the word Corinth, Corinthos came to mean to fornicate or to commit immorality because of the corruption that, that was in, in the city. One writer described Corinth as a seaman's paradise, a drunkard's haven, and a virtuous woman's hell. That was how the world looked at Corinth. That was not from a Christian standpoint. And yet, I think it's important for us to recognize that in the midst of that corrupt society, there was a church founded in that city, at least one, maybe more. Uh, and I think we need to remember Jesus in Matthew 16, verse 18 said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. In 2, Corinthians, or 2 Timothy chapter 3, in verse 1, Paul speaks of the fact that in the last days, difficult times will come. It will be difficult to live a, a life for God as we approach the end of this age. And in many ways, we see that creeping in to our society today. We see that corruption. We, we see that antagonism against Christianity and so forth. And I think there's a challenge in that for us. We can sit back and bemoan the darkness and get discouraged by how dark things are getting out there in the world. Or, as some have suggested, we can light a candle. We are the light of the world. We, we've been placed here for a, a reason. And I think we can say, praise the Lord, God is still at work in Soap Lake. God is still at work in America. God is still doing something. We may not fully understand all that's going on and all that's happening, but God is at work. He is still in control. We can trust the, the future to him. So that leads to the, the author here. And uh, I was told this morning that I made some mistakes in, in your notes. How did you put that up there for? That should be number three, actually. Uh, I don't have number three in my notes, so that's got to be number three. Okay, the author, anyhow. You, you've got it on your notes there. Uh, the author was the Apostle Paul, the founder of the church. If you read Acts chapter 18, you get the story of the time that Paul spent in, in Corinth there. He was met there with Priscilla and Aquila, tent makers by trade. Paul was a tent maker, so together they not only made tents, but they found it at church there as well. Later, if you go into Acts 18, 9 through 11, they were joined by Timothy and Silas. So quite a missionary force there uh, seeking to communicate the gospel to that church. Paul was no stranger to them, but he introduces himself in verse 1 as what? An apostle of Jesus Christ. He doesn't do that in all of his epistles. He, he does it when he wants to establish some doctrinal truth. And you will find a lot of doctrine being established in, in this particular book. He, uh, he, he's stressing some doctrinal issues. So in, in, in Acts 26, he, he, he speaks of that fact. I'm not going to take time to read that for you this morning. But notice he said, I am here by the will of God. He was there by divine appointment. Uh, he, he has a co-writer here, Sosthenes, uh, his brother. You know, Acts 18, 17 is where you first come in contact with him. And the interesting thing there, if you read Acts 18, you know, he was being beaten, not because of his faith in Jesus Christ, but he was ruler of the synagogue in Corinth. And evidently, somehow through that experience in that time, he came to the realization that he needed Jesus Christ as a savior. God was able to reach his heart in the midst of a corrupt situation, in the midst of the persecution that he was uh, experiencing there. And I think that should encourage us today. We do not know who God is touching through our lives. We do not know when we share the gospel whether that person is going to come to Christ or not, but God knows. God knows what he's doing, and if he could reach a ruler of the synagogue, he can reach our neighbor. 
He can reach our family members that are wandering away from the Lord. God is still able. We need to be faithful in presenting the word to, to them and be faithful in interceding in prayer for them because God doesn't always do it overnight. Sometimes he waits, and we need to intercede on a, on a regular basis for those that, that we know need our, our prayers there today. So that leads us to the recipients, and this was not in your notes. That, that's the correction I got this morning. I, won't, I was told I can't tell you who, who corrected me. Uh, she, she said I can't do that, so <laughs> I, 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 won't, I won't give her a name. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you, you should put this in, in, in your notes because point A and B actually come. She put it up there for you. Okay, comes under, under this portion. He was writing to who? To the church. To the, he uses the term the ecclesia, uh, which literally means an assembly in uh, Acts chapter 19. Uh, we have, a, have that word being used. Uh, in verse 39, it says, but if you want anything beyond this, it shall be settled in the lawful assembly. He's not talking of the lawful church there. He's talking about a government assembly there. So it, it simply means a, an assembly, a group of people that meet together, but it became known as, and the word is used to describe the church of God. We are meeting here as a church, as an assembly. The, the building's not the church. It's the people that, that gather there to worship. Uh, as it, it's important, as he writes here, he said, to the church of God, which is at Corinth. I think it's important to, for us to remember, this is not our church. I hope I don't shock you on that. This is the church you're identified with, many of you are members with, but it doesn't belong to us. It belongs to God. It, it is his church. We're an assembly that he has placed in so like uh, to, for a, a purpose there. It, it wasn't the church of the Apostle Paul. It was the church of God. The church today is not a perfect place. It should be a haven for the wounded. It should be a, a hospital for the sick. It, it should be where imperfect people can come together and learn about God and begin to grow and, and to become more like G Jesus Christ. And, and it's good for us to keep in the back of our mind, it's not ours, it's his. It's not about us, it's about him. We, we need to be worshiping him today. And as, as we think of that, we need to remember that Christ came to call sinners to repentance. He didn't come to call the righteous. He said, I came to call sinners to, to repentance. So do we have some sinners here today? I think we do. As a matter of fact, I know we do. Uh, because I'm a sinner saved by grace the same as you are there. But notice how, what he says about those who have come to be a part of the assembly there. He said, first of all, they are sanctified. The word sanctified means set apart. They were set apart for the glory of God. Now, I think it's important for us to realize they were not home yet. They were not perfected entirely yet. They were, they were growing. They were moving that direction, but they were not all that they should be. Uh, when he talks of being set apart or sanctified here, I, I think of what we looked at a couple, months, a couple months ago in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Where in verse 23, he says, may the God of peace himself sanctify you wholly. May your spirit, soul, and body be preserved, complete, without blame, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. In a sense, we have been set apart as part of the bride of Jesus Christ. We're in the engagement period. We uh, are, are not home with him in glory yet. We're moving that direction, but we're not there yet. But have you ever noticed an engaged couple, how their focus is on what? One another, yeah. They're not looking for a third party. They're not looking for somebody else. They're set apart for each other. And that's what he's suggesting here. We're set apart for God. Uh, positionally, our spirit has been sanctified. We have 
been justified in Christ. Progressively, we're a work in progress. We're being sanctified as he's changing our soul and, and, and so forth to, to conform it to the image of Jesus Christ. And then uh, ultimately, our body will be changed and transformed and we'll be home with him in glory. And that whole process of sanctification will be complete in that day. I, I was encouraged yesterday, we had a, a baptismal service and one of the candidates for baptism, and I don't ask me which one, I won't embarrass them anyhow, uh, used as part of their testimony, Philippians 1, 6. He that hath begun a good work in you will do what? Will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. He is working in our heart and life. He's changing us. He, he's making us more and more like him. And he's going to continue that work until we are home with him in glory. And then that process will be complete. Now, as I say that, if God has to work in your life and maybe chip away some rough edges and deal with some issues that, that you confront at times, do you have the grace to look at your brother and sister and say, hey, maybe God's working in their life too? Uh, we, we, if we're not careful, we tend to get critical of other people, don't we? And forget that God in his grace is still at work in, in, in their lives as well. So he said they're sanctified. And then he calls them saints. Now, how in the world can he call them saints with all the problems that he reveals in, in the book of Corinthians? I think we need to re realize that a saint is not a miracle worker. It, it's not a perfect individual. It, it's not someone that we should even dare to pray to. It's not somebody that's been acknowledged as a saint by man. A, a saint is someone who has been called of God and accepted Jesus Christ as their personal savior. And so he could write to Soap Lake and say to the saints in Soap Lake, that would be you and I. We, we, we've been set apart for God. Uh, we're in that process of becoming like Christ. We, if we've accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and savior, we're saints in progress there. Uh, Romans 10, nine and 10 speaks of the fact if we confess with our mouth, the Lord Jesus believe in his, our heart that God hath raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. We shall become in that moment saints. And we're in the process of becoming then like Christ. Someone has wisely said, God justifies the unholy and then makes them holy. That, that's the process that we're going through. That's the process that the church in Corinth was going through as a church. And I think we can say, praise the Lord, he is not finished with us today. Praise the Lord. He's still at work. He, he's working in us. He's working through us. We can wrestle with some issues and problems perhaps, but God's power is not limited today. God is able to work in each of our hearts and lives. And so I want to close with a couple of questions. First of all, are you a saint? Some of you aren't sure. Uh, let me introduce you to the Jesus Christ. If, if you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're not a saint. You have to make that choice. And if you would like to make that choice today, I'd be happy to sit down with you and share with you what you need to do in that regard and how you can become a saint today. And those of you that have already made that choice to accept Christ are you seeking to live a holy life? Are, are you seeking to become like Jesus Christ? Are there some problems in your life that you need to work on? Now, we probably all have problems. The, the obvious part of that question is, are we willing to work on them? Are we willing to let God transform our mind, transform our lives to, to shape us into the image of Jesus Christ? Are you looking forward to letting God bless you as you walk through this life and help you to become more and more like him. Let's pray. Father, we marvel sometimes at the fact that you look at us and say, there's one of my saints. And we recognize that's only because of the grace of Jesus Christ. And so we thank you that we are recipients of that grace 
today. Give us the courage, as Corinth had the courage, to take a look at the, our lives and ask us there areas that need to be worked on, areas that need to be changed. And if you reveal something to our heart, give us the courage this week to work on it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.